The top executive of a Hollywood studio comes to your door with a briefcase full of money and hires you to write Star Wars Episode Nine. In order to have any hope of making it as a writer in LA, it must be commercially and critically successful. What's your angle? All right, guys, welcome to... God damn it, I didn't think of a name for this podcast yet, but it's the second time we're doing it. And today we are here with three very, very talented writers to discuss what would their take be on Star Wars Episode Nine? So first, let me introduce the panel from last time. If you guys listened to our Joker episode, we got Tommy Cook. What's up, Tommy? Hey, Jared. Tommy is uh, right now. He's a writer's assistant on the new Charmed show. Oh, so thank, thank he's you. he's just talking about writing every day. We also got with us a newcomer. <laughs> we got Abiel Brune. Abe is a. Why well, did you say hello, Abe? <laughs> hello, Jared. Yeah, let's hear my credits real quick. <laughs> yeah, Abe's a fucking filmmaker. Abe has made a horror movie that I have seen, and it's fucking good. And, uh, it's coming, actually, coming out actually, this summer, August 6th. Little, little, oh, cool. Yeah, little plant there, August 6th. August 6th. Where awesome. can people see it? Anywhere that they yeah. have internet and a TV and a computer at home. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> What's it called? Not to just plug you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, called the, it's called The Night Sitter. Uh, cool. Yeah, so check it out. VOD, uh, Blu-ray, Redbox, all that good shit. Okay, cool. And we got returning again, Michael Lux. What's up, Lux? Hey, Jared and everyone. Lux Night is, is a good title, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Lux is an illustrious writer and director for us, as well as writing that he does for a wrestling show in Austin called PWR, Party World Wrestling, as well as other projects. So today we're talking about Star Wars Episode Nine. A lot building up to this movie. So first, I want to ask. What do you guys are you guys excited for this movie and what do you think it's going to be like? If you had to guess what is going to happen, not necessarily what you would have happen, what do you think will happen? Let's start with Tommy. Tommy, are you excited? Cautiously excited. Okay. Um I, I, I rewatched the other two films uh before doing this episode and I I didn't like them as much this second time around. Mm. Um, I found them sort of tough to get through. Mm. Having said that, I, I like J.J. Abrams. I'm excited for anything he does. Um, I actually liked Force Awakens more on this rewatch mm. than Last Jedi, so I'm excited a little bit. And do you have any estimate or any guesses for any big plot points or what it's going to feel like at the end? <laughs> these movies are the, the, watching these movies. They're so hard to predict plot wise because there's barely any plot in them there it's just it's just uh you know going from world to world it's a world building exercise it's like let's go see the crazy world here and let's go see the crazy world there so it's really hard to say plot point wise what it's going to be but i would suspect that it'll be like return of the, the jedi because <laughs> that's what jj does <laughs> okay He's, so like big things like uh, ray's parents kylo ren thought, is he going to be is he going to go straight bad i thought we answered those questions like ray's parents do, don't matter so you don't I think don't they're going to so. no i don't think so and i think it'll be you know ren versus ray like i feel like that's where it's so, going so all the shades I, of gray in ren are going to go away i feel like he embraced his like we need to destroy the jedi and sith and that's now his mission statement like i don't see the i feel like they played too much with the is he going to be a good guy maybe i don't like i don't think they can double back on that now mm. i think he has to go full dark here um otherwise it's like uh, it's just the same beats over and over again for three movies yeah do you have any thoughts on the whole Darth Sidious thing? Oh, my God. Um. <laughs> Wait, hold, hold, hold up. Is Darth Sidious the Emperor? Oh, have you is not? The, a, is yeah, the yeah. Emperor Darth Sidious? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like there's like a uh, – I was researching this. There's like a thing that um, sort of the, the Sith can do where they can transfer their consciousness into other bodies or things. And so my guess is he's like transferred him, his consciousness into something else, some sort of other life form potentially. <laughs> Wait, when, and when then you say the, you research uh, this, what does that mean? I mean, I, mean, I just looked on, on Wikipedia. Well, like when I was like p like figuring out what I was going to pitch, I was mm -hmm. like, had they ever done this? Yeah. And like but, every single thing, of course, <laughs> there's but, a version of it. This is like extended <laughs> canon. Yeah, extended like, canon. Literally yeah. Everything. yeah, literally yeah. anything you can think. <laughs> it's okay. like, oh, there's a, they've See, done it. <laughs> for me, canon is the fucking the movies. movies. Yeah, and I don't give a movie. shit uh -huh. about anything yeah. else. Uh -huh. But I agree. But uh, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I agree. All right, Abe, excited? And what do you think is going to happen? Um, I got to admit, I'm not I'm not really excited at all. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could take or leave uh, this movie. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty fair weather, like basic Star Wars fan. Like I loved the first three just because it was sort of the time of my life I was watching them. Mm -hmm. But like, even at the time I was watching them, I was like, yeah, it's good, but like... You mean four, five, and six? Yeah, four, five, and six. Okay. Yeah. Even at the time I was watching them, I was like, you know, it's good, but it's not like Indiana Jones good. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's not 
poltergeist good, you know? So, like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I loved the movies because they were, like, such a, you know, space adventure. You're young. I mean, the height of my Star Wars hype was probably Phantom Menace because I was, like, 11. Mm, sure. And then there's, like, a quick drop-off in teenage years when I was, like, you know, fuck Star Wars. I like the doors now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, like... Uh, pretty much the new movies I've I've seen all of even the spin-offs all the new movies I've seen once in theaters and I sort of felt like they were all the same they were all like pretty fine but like I didn't really see what the fuss was about one way or the other um I will say that I think that you know I kind of agree with what Tommy was saying I think episode 9 is going to be a lot it's going to be like Force Awakens crossed with Return of the Jedi um, mm-hmm. You know, because I think really Star Wars, you know, I kind of agree like, it's short on plot. And I'd go even further to say, like, Star Wars is the rare, huge franchise that actually isn't even about anything. Like, it is just about, like, like can you even imagine a scene of, like, the Empire and the Rebellion, like, at the negotiating table? Like, what, no. like, what is no. anyone's goal? There's only going, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's only going to be explosions. Yeah, like, what is anyone's Wait goal? Wait till my pitch. <laughs> and, they've done, yeah, and they've done it now. The Phantom Menace to yeah, dude. a business meeting. You know, they've, they've done it now in the new series, too, where they're like, oh, it's now it's the First Order and the Resistance, and it's mm-hmm. totally, you know. So I just think they're going to play the hits, you know. I mean, J.J. Abrams is great at making big movies. He makes movies that feel awesome but mm-hmm. aren't really, like, when you think about them, you're like, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't actually make any sense, you know. Um, and I think, like, the pe- what people didn't like about Last Jedi is that it's actually a whole bunch of small movies happening at the same time. They, mm-hmm. like, split all the characters off, and they're all, like, doing something that's very actually, like, dialogue-driven and character-driven. And then just because they're all stacked on top of each other, people are like, oh, it's an epic movie. But I think f- episode nine is going to be like a truly huge epic movie. All the characters are going to be doing some mission together. And it's just going to be like return to what people love. It's okay. going to feel like Star Wars more so than like necessarily closing everything off and resolving everything in like a satisfying way. Sure. I would think. Cool. Lux, what about you? Excited? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, I'm pretty much where Abe's at as far as like Star Wars background, except for I you can't pay me to like the doors. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, pretty much agree. Like I, yeah. the 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 only Star Wars movies I ever like really super got mega into were Empire and then also The Last Jedi. I actually really like The Last Jedi, um, largely for the reasons that you just said. Like I like the sort of structuralist idea or like functionalist uh-huh. or what is it formalist of like a bunch of mini movies that all sort of add up into one big idea um together and i like that and that sort of is how in a way how jedi is structured just in the sense that you have like luke off doing his thing then han's doing han and leia are doing their little missions on endor yeah um and i think that we'll probably see basically that structure in in episode nine right where like ray goes to deal with kylo ren and like poe like uses the lessons he learned from laura dern to like do some cool general stuff and then like john boyega I will do something cool, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then, and then you'll have like a movie. Yeah. Um, and that's cool. And it'll probably be pretty fun, but I'm, I'm, all, I'm also not a big JJ Abrams fan. Um, I think that, yeah, his movies sometimes feel really good and big when he's nailing it, but I don't always think he does nail it. And when he's not, when that like epic feel and propulsion isn't there, it becomes really obvious the places where they fall apart. And I'm just like, ah, oh, I hate this. I hate movies <laughs> where I start being drawn into like nitpicking them while I'm watching them. Mm. Yeah. Which happens with JJ Abrams a lot for me. Yeah. I, th- first of all, I think that the whole thing is, go- they're going to tr- see, I disagree with Abe only in that. I think they are going to try to wrap it up. And I think that's why Darth Sidious is back. And they're basically going to say like, Oh, you know, this is all the conflict of this movie is a continuation of something that was established in I, as early as episode one. And I just honestly cannot imagine this movie ending and not being like super fucking cheese ball. Yeah. Just <laughs> but yeah, but that's sort of what I was saying though. Like when the emperor is like they reintroduce the emperor, it's like that for me. That's not necessarily like closing something off in a satisfying no, way. Not. That's just like saying, hey, remember the thing from the like we got this guy again. You know? Do you think there's right, going to the be a fourth Death Star? A, clo- a satisfying closure because it just means that there's no. Like anything can just come back again later. How many of you do you think? Okay, are we going to see Qui Gon? Are we going to see Obi Wan? Are we? I mean, how many? How many of these characters do you think we're actually going to see? I think we see them all. Yeah. See, I hundred percent. I kind of think yeah. so too, and that 100%. that seems a it's little bit. Dude, I didn't yeah. even think about mm-hmm. actually like. I mean, I yeah. 
Qui-Gon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liam's in the new MIB. He'll be there for yeah. Star Wars if they, yeah. <laughs> if they well, have the, the last, money. The last movie did seem to change the rules for, like, Force Ghosts, or maybe that was always the rules and I just don't remember, but I didn't they used to just be like transparent and like in the corner and now like Yoda was a force ghost yes. in the last movie so now they can just be characters in a movie like affecting the physical world around them like they're pretty much just people I think that's always been how it is but I mean Luke that was is actually a big a big deal it was a big change that oh, yeah, oh, Yoda know, is able to saying. you know uh, light the uh, the Jedi yeah. temple on fire oh right, like, right 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 so at that point it's like they yeah just like you can just do whatever like Luke could just be a character in this movie essentially who's just you know so is, Lux you don't scenes. think they're going to do any retconning I I'm worried that they will. I'm worried that basically this movie's gonna take back all the things I liked about The Last Jedi <laughs> and then just like I don't, shit back yeah. like just shit back a movie with like Darth Sidious and Qui Gon, all these characters that we love know that we know and like quote unquote love. Yeah. Um and then I'll just be driven insane. <laughs> yeah. Well try to hang on to your sanity, man, because Does Luke stay dead? Is he a force well, ghost? He's a force ghost. The... So no. Yeah. Is is but that but the, yeah. in the trailer the last line is nobody's ever yeah. really gone. There and, is and also, no death. Death, death is academic in Star Wars and has been since the... the very first movie. It's like, oh, so now you just chill yeah. in some other plane. Forever. In the Vanity Fair picture, he's like right next to R2 R2 D2 and he's like touching him. So I mean I mean I, I mean it could be in post that they add like the, the ghost orb effect, but yeah. uh, I don't <laughs> No, but that's what I'm saying. Like Yoda didn't have a ghost orb effect the whole time, did he? Uh, I actually did like, not. I, Wait, did he? I think I, it was a little really, blue. It was a little blue or yeah, I think oh, okay. a little bit. But okay, he still yeah. could affect the physical yeah. world, yeah. which p some people were pissed off about. It would be kind of <laughs> cool, though, if the thing is that, like, Ray becomes a necromancer <laughs> and, like, brings back all, like, the ghost Jedi to fight the battle with her. That would be um, So <laughs> I, I wish I'd thought of that before right now. Yeah. Before we go to the pitches, I'm just going to say my hot take on why I think it's called Rise of the Skywalker and how I think they're going to pseudo-retcon it. Uh -huh. I think what's going to happen is they are going to because the the last jedi ends on this whole thing where we're going to preserve the legend of luke skywalker and that's going to inspire hope in a new rebellion and new people are going to join the rebellion mm -hmm. and even though there's only like 30 people surviving through the legend of luke skywalker people are going to rise up and take down the empire or whatever in order to like continue to stoke the flame of that legend ray is going to lie to everybody and say that she is the daughter of luke skywalker so that the pissed off fans that wanted her to have noble blood mm. will be like, oh, okay, you know, they're gesturing towards that. They're basically retconning it while they're not actually retconning it because she still is the daughter of filthy drunk traders. Mm. That's I would really like that, particularly because it would sort of implicitly undermine the idea that any of that shit matters at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's called Rise of Skywalker. I think you're like, I, I kind of think the setup of what you said is correct. Like, I think that'll happen, but I, I think that it's going to be, I don't think they will wreck. I think it's actually going to be like a key part of Star Wars lore moving forward that literally anyone in the universe can be special and have these powers. So I think they're going to try to move as far away from this idea that it's this closed circle of special people that like happen to mostly be yeah, white yeah, yeah. guys mm -hmm. up until now. You know, like, I think that little thing at the end of The Last Jedi where it's, like, some random kid making a broom move, I think they're going to lean hard into that and be, like, yeah. any, anyone But that, that is the thing this. that a lot of the fans hate. I just think... And the reason why I don't think they're going to retcon it too hard is because J.J. Abrams, like, hates that side of fan culture. So just the idea of him bowing down to that seems unlikely. Yeah. Anyway, let's I don't get... I get why fans hate that so much. It's so much cooler to be like, oh, I could be a Jedi than to be like, I like to think of a universe where I could never have magic <laughs> yeah. powers. No, it's just because everyone wants to think that, oh, no, I'm the only one who can be a Jedi. All these other plebes can't. Yeah, and everyone right. just thinks that they're the special <laughs> yeah, one. Right. That's, <sighs> that's very true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, let's get to the pitches. So last time we, when we did the Joker, Tommy went last. So, Tommy, we're going to have you go first this sure. time. All right. So give us, give it to us. All right. Oh, this boy. is pitch number one. Number Tommy one. Cook. All right. So I approached this like I was being asked to pitch, you know, the third part in this particular saga. Yes, that so is appropriate. For me, this new trilogy is all about cycles. Force Awakens deliberately mirrors A New Hope, both in plot and character. Kylo Ren is Darth Vader. Snoke is Palpatine. Both heroes live on a desert planet, etc., etc. Uh, this creates this sort of feeling of repetition, the sense of a repeating cycle. And this is where Less Jedi comes in, because it's all about our main characters trying to break out of their own personal cycles. Kylo Ren rejects his Vader 
Elder Wannabe Mask and kills Snoke, his mentor, he's no longer beholden to the old Vanguard. Finn also rejects his own personal cycle of running away from the First Order, from the Resistance. He comes into his own as a hero and makes a stand by the end of Last Jedi. Similarly, Rey breaks free from the cycle by a cycle of waiting for her parents. She acknowledges that they're never coming back and that they're pretty much the worst parents of all time. So now, in episode 9, the question becomes, can our characters break free from the larger historical cycle of light versus dark? Or is the story doomed to constantly repeat itself over and over and over again? So, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Woo! Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. Our opening scroll over the galaxy tells us good news for once. The legend of Luke Skywalker has inspired a new generation. With the Resistance rising in numbers and stature, the tide has finally turned against the New Order. However, the Resistance has intel that Kylo Ren has discovered a means to tip the war back into his favor. We pan down the galaxy to see First Order ships hovering over our planet. Then on the planet, boots stride through an alien alley. We're in a bad neighborhood. The boots round a corner into a derelict building. Inside, an alien opium den. den. It's disgusting. Dirt, bugs, grime everywhere. Creatures' eyes roll back as red mist hovers above them. The aliens seem to have been here for days, weeks, maybe years. We dolly up our boots to reveal a figure wearing a gas mask, searching for someone. The figure finds who it's looking for, an old wrinkled alien, breath shallow, barely alive. The figure tries to stir the alien, but he's totally out of it. No use to anyone. The figure takes his gas mask off, revealing our hero, Ray. She inhales the, the red mist above her. Her eyes roll back, and suddenly this disgusting, grimy area transforms into a posh and rich dining hall. Lavish. Everything you could ever want. In this drug haze alt reality, she finds the same alien from before, except here he's alert and regal looking. Ray tells the alien she's been here she's here to protect him. They have intel that the First Order is on the way to get him. He needs to come with her now. But the alien refuses. After what he did, he deserves whatever fate is coming. The only refuge, refuge for him is this fake life with his opium-induced haze. But what did this alien do? Hundreds of years ago, an ancient Sith Emperor tried to perform a witch ritual where he would have the ability to completely bypass the Force, harnessing only the darkness within. With this power, he could destroy the Force itself, ending the balance in the universe, tilting everything into absolute darkness, a la the video game Knights of the Republic. The Jedi defeated this ancient Sith, but the process to harness such unimaginable power was written in a text, passed down through the generations, kept watch over by the Jedi, making sure no one else got their hands on it. But as, as the Jedi fell, circa Revenge of the Sith, uh, this alien did something unimaginable. Out of fear for his own life, he gave the ancient text to the enemy, to Emperor Papaltine. The guilt and shame weighing, in, weighing on him, the alien sought refuge in this opium paradise because the secrets of this ancient book, if harnessed, could tilt the world forever into darkness. So the basic plot of episode nine would be a race for this ancient text whose secrets hold the key to not just ending the war, but ending the galaxy, the force itself. Now, Ray Finn, Poe, and the rest of the resistance are naturally going to have some questions on their journey, like, why would the Jedi pass down a book that could destroy the force and tilt the world into darkness? Why not just, you know, like, destroy the book? So they seek out answers, answers to these questions. But how do you find them? The only way to do so is to contact the ancient Force ghosts. To do so, Rey will have to pass over into the Force itself, which is dangerous and could cost her her life. There, in the ether between, she'll discover the truth, that this ancient, ancient ritual actually works both ways. Yes, you could use the book to destroy the Force and bring about only darkness, but you could also destroy the Force and bring about only light. So the question becomes, if you could create a perfect utopia free from darkness, would you? Would we want to break the cycle? And so our heroes track down this book before Kylo Ren and New Order get the New Order get their hands on it in the last known place it was seen, the original Death Star, where Palpatine met his end. They search through the rubble of the Death Star for this ancient text, but Kylo and the First Order beat them to it. And in an epic lightsaber battle between Rey, Finn, and Poe versus Kylo Ren, Rey sacrifices herself to save her friends. Kylo Ren flees with the book, leaving Finn and Poe behind. Things look pretty bleak. The Resistance has lost the greatest ally and friend, and Kylo Ren has everything he needs to destroy the, for destroy the Force. But no one is gone forever. And in our epic finale, the Force Ghosts, Luke, Obi-Wan, Yoda, Rey et al., fight back to save the day from Kylo Ren. It's the Force fighting back against the one who wants to destroy it all. In the end, Kylo Ren is defeated, and now the Resistance has a choice to make. As long as there is light and darkness, this pattern will constantly repeat. History will be the same story over and over again. But as Go Force Ghost Ray instructs, this is the natural way. Light cannot exist without darkness. Our heroes decide not to destroy the cycle, but to embrace it. Cut to another planet 
where another boy, another girl, discovers their own power and force for the first time. And so we end. Find out more on <laughs> Disney+. Plus. <Yes. laughs> yeah. Oh, man, awesome. You know, the only oh. thing... I think that uh, in your ghost, your force ghost list, you definitely got to add Han Solo on there because I'm hey, sure yeah. Han Solo is going to have a little father son moment with Kylo Ren saying, "Don't can, do it, son." Can Han become a ghost? Is he like a man? Fuck the rules. And Harrison, like, yeah, yeah. I don't think Harrison would come back. He'd be like, um, "Nobody's uh, ever really gone. No one's ever really gone." Right? What do you mean Harrison Ford wouldn't yeah, come, come back? He likes money. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to get paid. He's doing Indiana Jones five, so he'll he'll, he'll do a day on Star Wars. <laughs> Yeah, I really like the green screen just get rendered blue. Yeah, I really like how first of all, I, I like how you kind of molded your pitch to the trailer, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> a, like everything. Yeah. No, no, that's cool. Because like, it, because in a sense, we can almost see which part of Tommy's pitch were actually echoed in whatever J.J. Abrams decides to do. No, that's really cool. I really like how I really like your opening crawl. I really like how it sets up, you know, the setup that, is so in depth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just like how the setup basically pushes us forward in time into where actually like things have reversed a little bit. I like the introduction of a whole new alien thing, and I like how you actually are trying to at least tease the idea, like first of all, recognize the idea that there's been a lot of cycles, and also tease the idea that it might actually come to an end. I think that the chances of that of them actually having that self awareness is yeah. are probably low. I was gonna say it's a it's a shockingly like meta pitch, you know, like you can also, see it in the room. You're like, what do you mean? <laughs> Cycles? What are you talking about? That 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 that, that, that doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> These are fresh it ideas. God damn it! Like, I mean, to be the philosophy nerd on deck, it's like a weirdly Hegelian story too. Like, yeah. It's just all like light, like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, over and over again, forever is like the end point of the story. Yeah. Um, which I am very into because that's pretty much how history works. I definitely think that we're going to see something like you described where all the force ghosts come together to do something definitive. I don't see how they don't do it, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate that again unless it's framed like Ray does necromancy, in which yeah. case, again, back on board. I would hate it unless it was framed like Ray does necromantic. Little, uh. little reference there for you guys. Nice. Yeah, very well done. Yeah, the heads can look that up. Tommy, like last time, I would love if they did your movie, but I really think the movie they're going to do is, I mean. I think critics would like that movie. I'm, I think the audience might be, it might be a little too, like, inward facing for the audience, you know? Yeah. You think they just want to see blue sword versus red sword yes blue sword wins 100 yeah. percent. yeah oh, you get your blue and red swords yeah no, i'll put some swords <laughs> yeah, sword, swords can, in there you can get the swords yeah in there. i got there yeah i'll give you your swords <laughs> that was yeah dude that was awesome <laughs> well um anything else you guys want to add to tommy's pitch i'm just kind of like wow dude i would watch that movie Oh, thank you, Jared. Yeah. Thank you. One, one I mean, I'm going to watch it anyway, yeah, but yeah, I would, yeah, I would yeah. enjoy yeah. that movie. I, I had would, you I would, at Star Wars. I yeah. would appreciate... <laughs> That's the thing, is that all these movies would get made because they start with Star Wars Episode Nine: Rise of Skywalker opening crawl. And then yeah. everyone would get mad at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the common denominator. But see, that's I, the I don't thing, know if though. they'd kill Rey. That's mm. that's the one thing that jumped out. But at nobody's me. ever really gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still, they can like you know, I, I, that just seems like a, a reach to me. Mm. I don't know. I feel like Ray, they're gonna be like, they're not gonna fuck around with that, you know? Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, but there's nothing better than a self-sacrificing hero. I mean, that makes that makes them like the ultimate badass. But but I they mean, just did that at the end of uh, the last movie. You know, that's like, true. Mm. I'm a big fan yeah, of the. I also feel like Vega or fucking Finn and Poe are kind of better narratively situated to sacrifice themselves than Ray is. I think. That's why I chose Ray, and also I like that you know I li I like movies where the main character dies about two thirds of the way through the movie. Yeah. Um, it's very rarely done, yeah. um, and so it sort of upends the narrative of the last act. Uh, it's the so to live and die in L.A. To live equation. and die in L.A. Yeah. equation, yeah, exactly. Totally. Nice. <laughs> the thing about your movie is that, like. It would be like, all right, we're going to admit that we're doing the same thing over and over, and, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. we are going to continue to do it yeah. at the end. We're basically promising it to you. I just, and That's the way I the would world. appreciate that. I would appreciate that. I would, <laughs> yeah. but I don't, I think they want to <laughs> pretend that nobody knows that they're doing the same thing over and over again. They want to do it kind of surreptitiously. They, they just want, Oh, God, I, I hope this podcast just doesn't turn too cynical, but I just feel like they're like, all right, team, we want to hit the nostalgia receptors in yeah. the brain, go. 
Well, it's good that you started with the Joker because there's probably a a wider range of reactions to that. It's hard Mm -hmm. for a a group of guys in their 30s to be seeing Star Wars Episode (laughs) Nine in 2019 and not be like a little bit cynical. Yeah, but then think of the people who are writing it. Are they all cynical? I talked to Tommy about this last week. I was like, so in the writer's room, when they're writing something that perhaps not everybody's super proud of, like, how cynical are they? Are they like... You know, oh no, dude! I think yeah, I've I think never worked earnest. on anything where that's any, everyone is earnest. I've never yeah. worked on anything that was yeah. So I mean, yeah, that same yeah. same here. You know, J.J. No, Abrams is what in his fifties. Like, oh, these rooms yeah. will just eat it up no matter what. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I don't know. It's like if you're working on it, everything is cool. It's like being an audience member and being a like creative like primary person is a very separate experience. You know, like. Yeah, but people yeah. get staffed and take jobs on things that they don't like. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, maybe I think probably your job in that case is to find something you like about it and mm-hmm. just create that. But in some situations, I would imagine that that's not possible. And really, you just have to go with what you think your audience wants. And if you yeah. look at your audience with contempt, it's going to be pretty cynical. Yeah. But like at the same time, I don't know. I mean, all the time you see trailers in movie theaters where like someone just gets like hit in the nuts with a football and then everyone starts cheering, you know? (laughs) So like, I I don't know, like where's the evidence that it's like, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think almost Tommy's pitch is like almost too cerebral. Like, I almost feel like it's this, like, we're going to really strip it down to like the philosophical question of good versus evil, light versus dark. Like, I think there'd be some people in the theater who would be like, oh, I'd choose good, you know, like, let's just keep going, you know, like. Well, the the second movie, though, The Last Jedi was definitely a step toward um, it's the most cerebral Star Wars movie. So I don't think it's un. I mean, maybe if Ryan Johnson was making the next one, we could expect something like that. But I mean, the trajectory of this current trilogy, given what it is, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that they might tackle questions like that. I don't know. What's the most intelligent J.J. Abrams movie you've ever seen? That was just thinking that exact thing and going through it in he's, my head. But he's more <laughs> of a know, visceral. Like Super 8. Yeah. He's a visceral guy. He's Mission like, Impossible uh, 3? The Star, yeah. I think Star Trek is, is a good movie. It's Absolutely. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Like there's, a, there's a propulsion to his movies that like really work. That, totally. Uh, yeah. I 100% agree with that. But that, And I think that's what makes him uh, sort of like force in the industry. But like he just does not make stuff where you're like, I don't know. It's just it's it's very flashy, very cool, very fun. But yeah. rarely yeah. are you saying he makes stand up and cheer movies. Like yeah. He makes movies so that you get to the part where the cool thing happens and you're like, hell yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he understands like, there, like, film language about the thematic implications of that moment. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, all right. So Lux, you went. Uh, you went for okay. Do you want to go last or do you want to go next? Uh, uh, I don't care. Uh, I'll go <laughs> last, I guess. All right, Abe, you ready? Yeah. Abe, let's hear it. All right, so. Real quick, can I just have Abe pull the microphone closer to his face when he's. Even closer? His thing? Okay. Or Is move this it good? around so it's more directed. Yeah, when you're talking to me, yeah. just make sure your mouth isn't like moving. Oh, away. I see. So yeah. you can pull the arm if you need to angle yourself. Yeah, you better. can You can just do whatever here. Yeah, okay. Manhandle it. I gotcha. All right, Perfect. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, you know, my number one, uh, you know, the thing I'm presupposing about the Star Wars franchise is that people actually like we look back now on the prequels, which were like the world building trilogy of Star Wars. And we say like, eh, like eh, we don't like that. Mm-hmm. You know, that was boring. That was stupid. The acting was bad. The dialogue was bad. Um, there's some stuff that people like, but they just don't they don't dig it. So for me, what I really feel like is that Star Wars is just entirely based around the feeling of what is Star Wars. It's like the world's only ephemeral franchise where it's like there was a time in everyone's life where they watched Star Wars and they just want that feeling again. So I very much feel like Star Wars Episode Nine is going to be proudly um, nostalgic about the way that it organizes its plot and its characters and everything. Um, And so I think that it's actually going to be the inverse of what Tommy was pitching. At the very beginning of the movie, I think it's going to have been like, I think they've talked about a time jump. So let's say it's probably like three years. That's, that's something that, you know, movies like to work with that kind of time frame. And the first order has basically taken over. Um, They, the, the reach of it is everywhere. They are this oppressive force and it feels like there's no escape, but the resistance, which was only, 30 people or so at the end of the last one 
has been in hiding and working these sort of like espionage style, um, small group, you know, like not big fights in space, but like infiltrating and, you know, uh, sabotage and stuff like that. And they finally have a plan to make a large scale counterattack on the First Order. And it involves rebuilding the wreckage of the Death Star to, to, uh, to create a new weapon. So they're going to use the Death Star as an earthbound, like, giant laser cannon. And basically they're going to lure the First Order into thinking they're ambushing a resistance installation, calling in all their ships, and then the surprise is going to be, hey, we're actually using this, this weapon that, that you've used against us twice, and now in the ultimate Star Wars end of everything battle, we're going to use it on you to defeat you. Um, so the number one thing I think is going to happen with the characters is that they're all going to be together. I don't think there's going to be a lot of separate missions. I think Disney's really going to be like, people love the chemistry between these actors. We've casted all these charming, charismatic people. Um, let's like, let's make these like screen grab meme moments that are going to be on Reddit and, you know, Instagram and shit for like two months after the movie comes out. You know, so I think that everyone's going to be together at the beginning. Princess Leia is going to pop up in the first act, and she's going to say some thematically relevant things to Ray and Poe, and then pretty much disappear probably until the ending, where she might like smile and nod while she's watching a video screen of them winning or something. <laughs> um, and the core group: Poe, Ray, Finn, Rose, um, some combination of droids. I'm guessing they'll probably stick C-3PO with Princess Leia and just be like, he's just back at headquarters. Um, but the R2-D2 and BB-8 and then Chewie, they get sent out together on a mission to find the Death Star planet where it's crashed and start, uh, you know, the process of building this thing into a functional cannon. Um, but they have to like chase a few MacGuffins along the way. And while doing this, they cross paths with Lando Calrissian and he winds up flying the Millennium Falcon with Chewie in the climax and they're like bait because it's like, you know, the ultimate fuck you to the First Order is like, hey, yeah, we're still using the Millennium Falcon to mess <laughs> with you guys. And basically, like, they're, you know, First Order is going to chase the Millennium Falcon towards this planet and, you know, they're going to get blown up. Uh, meanwhile, Ray is communicating with Force Ghost Luke all the time, who is going to be like a full fledged character that shows up in a lot of scenes with her. I don't think it's going to be like one or two scenes. I think he's, he's going to be like, a real person who's in the movie who has like an arc and everything. And as they travel through the galaxy, she's going to be encountering more and more people who have this access to the force and her force psychic abilities have developed so much that she can now, when she arrives on these new planets or in these new places, she can tell when people nearby have the force. And so she's building this new um, group of, you know, they're like the new Jedi, you know, the Jedi can't be reborn and the Jedi were corrupted. And there's all this stuff about, um, you know, they, they've really messed with the mythology of the Jedi and asked you to really be like, Oh, are they good or not? And there was that whole thing. I remember in the prequels with the midichlorians, which is like, you can only be a Jedi if you have it in your blood, yeah. which is like a really, you know, look at that now. And you're like, Ooh, like <laughs> that's, that's not what they want. Um, and so there's going to be this new type of force using person who is noble and open to everyone and it's not exclusive and they're called Skywalkers. Mm -hmm. And the handover is complete. Luke was the last Jedi. Ray is the first Skywalker. And as the movie ends, you're going to feel like now the force is not so much a secretive, exclusive ninja type thing it's more like just kind of you know everyone who has it uh all around the universe um you can come together and they're going to build a better world uh meanwhile kylo ren so i think all the stuff with him being wishy-washy good guy bad guy is going to just be gone i think as the movie begins he's just a villain and i think he's moved on you know he rebuilds his mask and I think that he is going to summon the Emperor somehow. Um, maybe it is in the wreckage of the Death Star. That would be pretty cool. Uh, I did not. Uh, I did not piece that together. Um, and I think he's going to idolize the Emperor now. He's sort of like probably thought about it and been like, "Yeah, I idolize Darth Vader, but like, you know, 
that dude wound up sort of being a pussy. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, that didn't do me any good. You know, I got totally screwed at the end of the last movie. So I think he's just going to go full evil, idolize the emperor. And, you know, it's funny. I rewatched the scene from Return of the Jedi where the emperor dies. And I, I feel like it's, I feel like they could say like, he didn't actually die. Like, I think it's edited in a way where they could kind of be like, they could figure out some weird thing to do. So I actually don't think the emperor is going to be a ghost. I think he's going to be like a flesh and blood character. Um, and I think Kylo Ren's instability and his like, you know, kind of weird, like witchcraft kind of, you know, uh, obsession with, you know, this, this, his side of this force conflict is going to alienate the kind of more military government side of the first order. And it's going to be actually like, uh, you know, like a coup. He's essentially going to kill all those, all those like snooty British guys who play the first order. Like they're all dead. I think they're gone. And he's going to organize a coup and take over the last Jedi or take over, sorry, the first order. And in his rage of leveling the playing field and evening the score and like having this personal grudge against these people, he's going to walk the first order into this final battle and see his ultimate defeat when they're all blown up. Um, and then, yeah, I wrote Ray fights the emperor and Kylo Ren in a lightsaber duel and wins. Both and, of, end of movie. End of movie. And both <laughs> of them. Um, no, I think the end of the movie is going to, is going to be like, everyone has survived. I think Kylo Ren's going to be dead. The emperor is going to be dead. Like, I think it is going to be a very much happy ending, not bittersweet, not like, like really just capping off like, Hey, it took nine movies in 40 years, but like good one. You know. Yeah, I really like <clears throat> I really like the distinction between Jedi and Skywalker that you came up with. I think yeah. that that's pretty darn clever. And I think that's that, why I was thinking of yeah. going second because I would, now it's going to seem like I stole that. And that, oh, yeah. no. I, you know, that was that was kind of like uh, that was online a little bit too. I think that's some that's like a fan oh, theory really? that has been like kicked around a little bit. Oh, yeah. has it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of overlap. I like that a lot. There's a lot. Of, there's a chunk of overlap between yours and mine that's gonna yeah. come up in shortly. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I think that the whole thing of them building a cannon out of the Death Star that's yeah. probably gonna happen. It's, yeah. I think like I, I I think it's too much for them to show it in the trailer to just like have a scene in the movie where they're walking by and they're like, yeah, that's the Death Star. Like that was really important once and then have it never be mentioned again. You know? Well, but, that's, I mean, with Tommy's pitch, he made it important, but it's not just another weapon that can, you know, ha be a threat to the entire yeah. universe, which I appreciate. Yeah. I like the thought of using this, this force of evil and, but then turning it into something for your own good for like, so if the yeah. resistance yeah. is going to turn the Death Star into something that can be, positive for themselves yeah. although you could look at oh. it as like they're turning uh they're using this evil weapon <laughs> so i mean they're yeah. turning an evil weapon to another evil weapon uh, but they're enforcing I like that the... too though because that plays with the ambiguity from t from the last yeah. jedi where they kind of talk about that yeah the del toro character <clears throat> yeah yeah i i just feel like they're not you know it's like i guess that's kind of a great microcosm of what i mean by like the nostalgia and like what feels right like I think that's the Star Wars version of subverting expectations is like in this movie, the good guys use the Death Star, you know, mm. like that's yeah. that I think that's <laughs> as far as they go in terms of like in this one, you know, Poe holds the lightsaber, you know, like <laughs> it's it's just like, I don't know. I mean, I, I do sound like I'm being overly cynical. I love the Star Wars movies, but I just I don't think there's a deep well for writers and directors to like call on in terms of like. Well, that's what Ryan Johnson tried to do, yeah. right? Well, and that's the thing is like you're that whole movie. Like I, you know, I, I, Lux, I know you said you really liked the Last Jedi, but for me, watching that, I was kind of just like every scene. I was like, wait a minute, what is this scene? Like, wh uh, why mean, is this a scene in the movie? My big, I don't really like the Last Jedi, and my criticism about it isn't really anything ideological, like a lot of people. I just think it's fucking boring. Well, yeah, that's that's what, that's, that's my agree. point. Is that yeah. it's just like. Yeah. It doesn't it, – and I, I guess that's why I said Tommy's pitch I think is too cerebral even because I feel like it's – I don't know. I feel like when they get into the force in this movie and that kind of thing, it's it's just going to be to like create action scenes and remind people who the good and bad guys are. I just think like getting into the thematic nitty-gritty of like – of what everything represents in this universe is – I would just be surprised if J.J. J. Abrams felt like he had no. time to do that in this movie no i don't i don't think he's going to do that i don't even think tommy thinks he's going to do that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, I think it's also it's, it's a little bit. Yeah, I, Tommy's version very much is like his like version of the movie that he yeah. would pitch, and I feel like it's like a full fledged like idea. Um, mine is more of like a hit list of like. <laughs> of like, like what I think J.J. Abrams is going to do. My version is to never get hired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, to be fair, the, to yeah. be fair, the point of the podcast is to get hired. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Tommy doesn't give a fuck. Yeah, I mean, look, if I was, yeah, I, I might have like taken off the um, Star Wars isn't about anything bit if I, if I wanted to get hired, but other than that, it would have been the same. Yeah. yeah, I mean, dude, I think you're right, and like in in ways, I think. J.J. Abrams being able to tap into this kind of excitement, this thing that really moves him, yeah. kind of moves him passionately, yeah. is great. Yeah. Like he should keep listening to that voice because I like I like the uh, the Force Awakens more than the Last Jedi, and that movie isn't really about anything other than good versus evil, and it's no. just more fun to watch. And you know, it's context free, good versus evil. You don't yeah. even know what anyone's goal is except for be the <laughs> that, representation. That only goes of... so far, though, because I mean, like, I rolled my eyes. I would say more than a little bit when another Death Star came back at the Force Awakens. If they do it again, like, but they've already point... done it again. It's in the trailer. Like, they're already doing it again. Like, for sure. Well, but you even said they could subvert it by having the good guys have the the, new, the remade Death Star. Oh, I see. I oh, see. Yeah. So, so yeah. What might, will probably happen is they have the good guys use the original flavor Death Star that's crashed, and mm -hmm. then they blow up. Maybe there's a new. What was it? The Star Destroyer. Fine. If that happens, like yeah. in the uh, end Star of the Killer second base, act, or yeah, like the, in the, the midpoint, then that's that's still different enough. I just don't want it to be another last act where it's like, how do we blow up a Death ultimate Star. weapon? No, but it's going to be subverted because that's what the bad guys are going to be asking in this one. They're going to be like, "Wait, how do we blow up the Death Star? Shit, we had these the fact plans that you're even saying ago. subverting. <laughs> yeah. That's more than they did in the Force Awakens. There was no subversions in that one. Yeah, that's true. But at the end of the day, it's still better than the movie that was all about subversions. So I'm not saying that yeah, one. Debatably is... better. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. Lux, bring us out with your pitch. All right, so um, if you guys remember my, the beginning of my Joker pitch last time, it was, quote, I don't think the Joker is interesting or cool. Um, <laughs> and a similar approach is on this one. Not that I don't think Star Wars is interesting or cool, but rather I think that there's a way of reading the new Star Wars movies that is different from what we've talked about, which is that the freeing of the Force from sort of its centralization of the Jedi is a metaphor for the freeing of Star Wars from the totalitarian grasp of George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> um and so what follows is a pitch for a movie basically framed around that idea. So we have a time jump that starts about seven, eight years after the events of The Last Jedi. Um, and our scroll is all about how throughout the galaxy, young Force users have started just popping up. Like it's happening now. There's a sudden wave of Force kids. Um, they're not just kids, like kids, adults, whatever. Everyone sort of the latent Force powers are starting to emerge for reasons about stuff. Um Mm. So what's happening is Kylo Ren and his buddies and Rey and her friends are sort of in a dueling race to get as many of these force kids into their various sort of training camps as possible. Um, so we open on that. We open on sort of a planet where there's some force kids. Rey shows up trying to get them out of there, explains that they are the Skywalkers, the new Jedi, blah, 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 blah. And then they have to escape from Kylo Ren and his buds who are chasing them. Uh once they get away, we learn that Ray has been trying to train up these Force kids, but the one thing that they do not have is lightsabers, because no one really knows how you make those until they find some old ancient Jedi text or like a ghost shows up and tells Ray that what lightsabers are made of is one thing and one thing only, and that is kyber crystals, which we learned in Rogue One is also what powers the Death Star weapons. So Ray and friends have to go find the Death Star and get the kyber crystals from there so they can arm their like militia of sort of proto Jedi Skywalkers or whatever. Meanwhile, Poe and Finn <clears throat> are sort of organizing the modern Yavin 4 equivalent of like the kind of guerrilla warfare of the resistance against the First Order. Um, and the First Order is being led at this point by General Hux because uh, Kylo Ren is off doing the sort of dueling Jedi Academy situation with Rey. Um, and what they're doing is trying to hit these like guerrilla, these sort of guerrilla tactics, blow up bases, stuff like that. But slowly but surely, the like noose is tightening around the resistance. Not in the sense of there's a new star, like a new Death Star coming for them, but just like slowly but surely, resistant outpost after resistant outpost getting taken down. The new, the first, even as the resistance gains in momentum, the first order gets closer and closer to finding where they are. Which is why at the beginning of the first act, uh oh, Leia, 
dead. Um, <laughs> she gets blown up. A bunch of stuff gets blown up. It's real bad. Um, and they are in deep, deep need of this sort of new batch of Jedi, not just because they need to like balance the force or whatever, but because a sort of small paramilitary Jedi group could legitimately swing some of these space battles. We saw Luke do it already, and also Anakin, and also lots of other kids. So we know that it's like a sort of viable thing to throw a Jedi in a ship and be like, blow up this Star Destroyer, it'll be fine. Um, so Ray and friends go off to find the Kyber Crystals. There's an encounter with Kylo Ren. Um, and they kind of, you know, chase him and his friends off, but not without some significant losses. Um, some of the kids, probably some of Ray's uh, buddies who go with maybe Rose um, get killed in this fight. And Ray feels some responsibility for it and debates disbanding the entire thing. That's when the ghosts show up, all the force ghosts and are like, look, you're the last chance to restore balance in the force. If you give up, like the kids who already died are not going to be the only kids who die. Also, the rest of the kids will die. So you're going to need to shape up and straighten out and get things going. And so she and the other Jedis or get or other proto Jedis, Skywalkers, get their kyber crystals, get some, get some, you know, get some uh, lightsabers going. And along with the resistance fly out to sort of take down the first order from the inside. So it's like sort of the first Star Wars in the sense of they're sneaking around a lot inside in the third act anyways, sneaking around inside of uh, Imperial base, but they're not trying to blow up the whole thing. They're trying to sneak up and, you know, shut it down, take it over, kind of like the shield on Endor, and also to take out Kylo Ren and Hux. And so Rey and her like strike force of, I guess, mostly teens to young adults um, set off to do this exact thing and they fight through um with some mixed casualties until she confronts uh kylo ren and his group of weirdos and there's a fight and then one of the children who has not been involved in the fight on or one of the children on ray's side starts laughing evilly and it turns out that kid is possessed by none other than our ghost friend darth sidious mm. <laughs> um and so ray is forced to sort of confront the fact that like this is a moment for her where she realizes that the sort of Darkness is inevitable. Like she can train every single young Jedi in the universe and there will still be Sith. It doesn't matter. Um, but that has to be something she's okay with. Something she has to take responsibility for. And so instead of she doesn't, they did they, instead of killing the kid, the kid, you know, is like, you can kill me, but I'm still Darth Sidious, a ghost. And I'll just go into some other thing. Cause I'm a ghost. Um, instead of killing the kid, she takes them away. Like, you know, captures the kid, uh, captures Kylo Ren. They are able to disengage the First Order. The successful disengagement of the First Order, like Command Center, goes off well or whatever. They win that fight. Slowly but surely, the Resistance starts to take back planets. And the movie doesn't end with, like, the Resistance having won everything, but rather with, like, the Knights of Ren, the dark side sort of temporarily corralled, the, like, evil-possessed Darth Sidious kid, like, exorcist-style, strapped in, like, a room by himself. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, the movie ends with sort of a kind of a final crawl, or at least the final location that like the war is not over, but like the good guys are going to win. Yeah. So just fade out on child strapped to bed. <laughs> you know, I think we probably get one more scene of like the good guys playing the next move. Um, and like, maybe it's even a flash forward a couple of years and Poe is like, shows up and is like, we took down another one guys. Like it's going great. Yeah. Poe's hair is um, slightly grayer. But is that everyone kind of high fives and then maybe like a freeze frame? I feel like that's almost um, too much. Find out on Disney Plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so yeah, that's I find it interesting how this is the, the second pitch that you've done that involves a lot of kids. <laughs> yeah, Wait, so, like, well, I it, didn't want to use children at first, but I was like, I can't do a big enough time jump to make them adults without making it. You can't cast Daisy Ridley anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah. can can the force not all of a sudden pop up in teenagers? Yeah, yeah, what's yeah I'm saying? that's why the yeah, he said he said like people teens, teens like yeah like I think that I think that the whole thing with the um, lightsabers being made out of material that is only in the Death Star is like spot like that's for me in my head I'm like that is exactly what Star Wars Episode Nine would do like that is like spot on and I like the arc of Rey becoming basically Luke from The Last Jedi or yeah. where he like becomes the teacher and then he's confronted by one of his students who are evil and now how does Rey react in this But I guess I didn't also understand situation. at the end Kylo Ren and the kid are just like prisoners then I think maybe Kylo dies. I just okay. feel weird about making Ray kill stuff. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like it feels like she should have Batman rules. Yeah. So um, Ray killing someone would be weird, but chaining up possessed kid is 
A okay. So wait, did hey, I priests do it all the time <laughs> in movies and also maybe real life? Ooh, that joke I, is bad. Yeah. We should maybe cut that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to. Yeah. I think we can trim that. We're I wanna leaving see, it in. I want to see the Star Wars equivalent of an exorcism scene. Like I want to see what that looks like in that universe. Like I love I that kind of thought. I need to have that be the ending. <laughs> yeah. Like did she I brings miss... out the Force Ghost and the Force Ghost and her like combined power like freeze the child. Yeah. <laughs> did I miss something? Maybe that's a or... better ending than just like they kidnap it. Did, do the First Order not? They don't have an ultimate weapon in your in your pitch. I don't think so. I think that like sort of like what you were getting at and what we were talking about with with uh, Tommy's thing. With, oh, I guess this has been across all three of them. Like the ultimate weapon thing just like feels like they've done it three times. <laughs> yeah. And like, what like, would they need it for now? Like, if if the whole I, I mean, I think. To what a, did they need it in The Force Awakens? Wasn't it more even in like in The Force Awakens? Wasn't it like they have to like? Isn't the whole point that they've pretty much squashed the rebellion now? Like, well, that brings the point. If they do do a time jump and it's like Tommy's pitch, where the rebellion has gained ground again, then that mm -hmm. gives you incentive. Then that gives. I them mean, that would be a need. complete retcon of the last movie. That would just be like we're giving just yeah. enough time so the the consequences of the last movie are no longer. I feel like the ending of the last movie is very positive. It's not Empire Strikes Back where you're. Like the the rebels have totally lost. Han is frozen. Uh, Luke loses his hand. It's a much more positive feeling that like oh everyone is united against these against the first order. It, Luke has inspired a new yeah. generation of people. So I mean I, that was my take at least from from Last Jedi that it's not. Yeah, I mean I think that that is pretty true. I just also think that the difference between this and like in in uh. New Hope, the Death Star is designed basically to like leverage the rest of the galaxy so they have to listen to the Empire. And the third one, basically the same, plus destroy Endor, I guess. Um, and then in uh Force Wagons, it's like this thing about like basically like this military coup. Um, but there's no like planet scale destruction that needs to happen for them to win the war in my in my mind in episode nine, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah I, it's just they have to find them like they have them outgunned to the point where as long as they, if they can figure out where they are it's like game over yeah. i just um, there's no way they need to blow up a whole planet they just need to like find where they are and send some ships there and shoot regular lasers at it i just don't think uh, there's any way that there's not going to be some sort of conflict where the the first order is either about to destroy a whole bunch of planets with their laser thing or about to kill everyone in the resistance there's going to be some sort of definable conflict that they have to stop the first order from achieving i i don't know it, it can't just be that like oh well they run the galaxy and we need to stop them i feel like it's gonna be that you know the the kind of coup thing i was talking about i mean i didn't remember that that actually happened in force awakens that that yeah, they, like, they like blow up the senate yeah like general hux like takes over and it becomes like a military like coup right yeah, God, effectively, I, they, like, I did not the rewatch the movies. And then yeah. they're like, now we're in charge. Look at our huge gun. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, but, you know, like, this idea of the coup with Kylo Ren taking over, I mean, I just think that they're going to want to get... The, the First Order is the part of the series that I feel like is least modern. Like, these, like, military uniformed guys with, like, you know... English accents like it's so it's really a carryover of like the thing from the 1970s 1980s movies that feels most out of touch which is like little caps and like we must stop them you know pound fist on table so right. I think Kylo Ren is gonna just take it's gonna be about him and it's not gonna be so much about politics and tactics and all that anymore it's just gonna be about him controlling this huge force of uh, you know of ships and of the first order and just wanting revenge or wanting to prove that he's the most powerful and just kind of like you know having a temper tantrum i also think that for me the contemporary mood like in the first in the first batch of star wars movies came out like that was like cold war times that was like total evisceration is like an on the table thing in a way that is like scary and real yeah and now uh, now times the thing that feels scary and real is like what if we all lived underneath an authoritarian regime yeah um and like that's like a more scary outcome so for me it's like it doesn't have to be like we got to stop them from blowing up yavin 4 it just to be like if we don't win this war and like time is running out because they're getting stronger and closer to killing us every day mm -hmm. um if we don't win this war like that's it the galaxy is an autocracy forever yeah. um and that for me is like more than enough stakes to make it feel urgent that makes sense to me and you think that it's going to be probably kylo ren who's that authoritarian figure rather than sidious yeah, I think so. I think Sidious, like, if, if you, that's why I picked Sidious haunting the kid. Um, my first version of this was like Sidious, like, is just back.
but I think that yeah, I like Sidious haunting the kid or Sidious doing something more tangential because like he like what he's he tried already and fit you know what I mean like I I'm not one of those people who's like every time the bet it's like maybe it's just a wrestling thing but like every time the bad guy loses I feel less inclined to be scared of him next time do you know what I mean yeah no. and Palpatine just that. like eating shit so many times it's like oh great this ghost of an incompetent guy is back I'm real yeah. worried about it <laughs> yeah um like I'd much rather have like a Kylo Ren or even General Huck so I think they could push in that direction be like driving that car um because yeah I really do like this is what I'm saying I think that if you take this like George Lucas is the tyrant thing um and make that Sidious or make that whoever and have it be like this democratized force is like the thing that lets them stop him. It's like a pretty clear little story about like Star Wars used to be this one guy's little weird playground, but now it's for all of us weirdo artists, JJ Abrams, Ryan Johnson, uh, Benny off and wise, uh, you know, John Favreau, yeah. fucking Ron <laughs> Howard. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. Everyone can play in this world. All the it's weirdest for- people in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Ron I mean, Howard. I'm sure. I'm sure they're, <laughs> The, the people who are responsible with franchises. Unconventionally, yeah. you know. Yeah. I guess it's like a playground for white guys, but that's like a different thing yeah. for a different time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just think that like, it feels like one thing they would celebrate is sort of this liberation of Star Wars from this like soul brain. And so I just kind of am very into the idea of like using the force and metaphor for that and like democratizing Star Wars in that way. Because that was kind of, that that reading, even if it wasn't Lucas specific, is part of why I like The Last Jedi so much. That it's like democratizing the idea of the Force in a way that like never really happened before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that's a cool theme and a thing that resonates with me very strongly. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Send us an email at movies at wisecrack.co and tell us which pitch you would like to see on the silver screen. Or send us your own pitches or give us a call at 213-534-8807. Leave us a voicemail with either your own pitch or tell us which pitch you like best. I want to thank my guests, Tommy, Abe, and Lux for joining me. Thank you, Jared, for having us. Yeah. That's Jared. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize that was a key. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Um, where can we find you guys on the internet? You guys, oh, so Abe, you want to plug your movie again? Hold on real quick. I'll just plug this movie, The Night Sitter, horror comedy, August 6th, being released domestically. Uh, if you live in the UK, it's coming out June 17th or 18th. Oh, they get it early, huh? Yeah, they do. A little, little tasty teas over there um yeah and i'm on twitter at abriel brune and the movies at the night sitter on twitter also cool um so yeah tommy uh i can be found at uh at tc4949 um on twitter which i never really use anyway but hey yeah. <laughs> and lux uh yeah i'm on twitter at ml surfboard and i'm on instagram at game voice pod you can also listen to the game voice podcast if you like video games and i guess me mm-hmm. um and then, yeah, Party World Wrestling is the other big thing. Uh, you can check that out at Party World Wrestling on Facebook or twitch.tv slash Party World Wrestling. Um, it's cool. It's weird. Uh, there's a pizza man and a cyclops and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and that's cool. And then also, obviously, you know, I write and direct a bunch of videos at Wisecrack. So check out the Wisecrack videos and you'll probably see something I did. I recommend watching any of the or listening to any of the podcasts that Lux did in May because him and his co-hosts did all horrible video games. And maybe I'm just a sadist, but I, I like listening to them <laughs> freak out about how bad these games are. Yeah, you can also listen to any of the episodes with Jared. Those are pretty good. Oh, also. thank you. All right, guys, wrapping it up. Thanks for listening, guys. Peace. Peace.